Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Tracy, some 5 million people in the U.S. have congestive heart failure. Their heart is just too weak to pump enough blood. Now, that usually doesn't happen all of a sudden, and there are ways to predict that it will or that it may happen. But they're expensive, and they're not always readily available. But now, by combining artificial intelligence with a simple EKG, Mayo Clinic doctors have found a quick, inexpensive way to do it. A cheaper way to discover that there is a problem with the pump, the pump being your heart. Coming up, we'll hear from two members of the research team about the new technique. And later on in this segment, we'll talk with a woman from Scottsdale, Arizona, who discovered that her heart was in atrial fibrillation when she tried on her husband's new Apple Watch. What a great story. Joining us in studio to tell us about combining AI with EKG to detect early heart failure is Dr. Paul Friedman, chair of the Midwest Department of Cardiovascular Medicine and Mayo Clinic cardiologist, Dr. Peter Noseworthy. Gentlemen, welcome both of you to the program. Thank you. Great to be here. Now, before we start, I want to know what that is hanging around your neck. Uh, (laughs) Our listeners obviously can't see it, but uh, it looks like you've got a speaker on the end of your stethoscope. Well, it, this is a digital stethoscope, and it has two metal plates on either end of the listening piece. So in addition to digitally recording the sounds that I would listen to, it also records an ECG simultaneously. So by putting the stethoscope on the chest, we get ECG as well as heart sounds. The beauty of that is they're digital, so that we can apply artificial intelligence to that. So any practitioner of any specialty can benefit from these algorithms and essentially have an expert cardiologist in his or her pocket to say, hey, there may be a problem here. Let's check Tracy's heart. (laughs) (laughs) We don't have time for that. (laughs) All right, so now that that we can better understand this this new technique, if one of you would first explain congestive heart failure and also what is meant by left ventricular dysfunction. Great, well, congestive heart failure is a weakening of the heart muscle. And it typically results in shortness of breath or inability to exercise. Many people are very bothered by congestive heart failure, but a small portion of the population may have weakening of the heart muscle that they're not yet aware of. And if we could pick that up early, then we can intervene with medications or devices to prevent it from progressing and to try to prevent people from having some of the adverse effects that are associated with heart failure. So that's our goal, finding the people who may not even know yet that they have a weak heart muscle. Why is it hard to diagnose? It would seem that it would be easy to figure out. Well, it's easy when it's obvious, but it's harder when, when you're doing okay. And we use, typically use something called an echocardiogram, similar to an ultrasound that's used to look at a baby, for instance. And there you can look at the actual muscle of the heart in action and see how it's working. But you have to have a reason to do that test, and you have to have about an hour, and it costs a fair amount of money. And it's not a practical screening test Um, at the level of the general population. So you have come up with something new, something different, and tell us about that. So um, what we did was we used a neural network to empower the ECG, to make it a more powerful test so that the ubiquitous, inexpensive, widely available, 10-second, non-invasive ECG can screen to see whether or not a weak heart pump is present and that you may then benefit for an echocardiogram. And the way it worked is as follows. A neural network requires a big amount of data to be trained on. And then once it's trained, it can run on a smartphone or on a stethoscope or something small. And at Mayo Clinic, fortunately, we have big amounts of digital data. So we took roughly 50,000 data points, that is ECGs in people who also had echocardiograms, and we would feed the ECG into the network and say this person's ejection fraction, which is a measure of heart pump strength, is 50%, which is normal. This one is 35%. After you do that about 50,000 times, then which you know for the computer may, may take an hour or two, um, the network learns. It learns from the data. The da- data actually train the mathematical equations in this nonlinear way. So now you have a network that you can give it any ECG and say, is a weak heart pump present, yes or no? So much the way a child learns, you hold up a fruit and say, this is an apple. And they'll say, oh, okay, after a time they learn it's firm, has a stem. Hold up another one, this is an orange, pitted, different color. Sort of the same concept. But with 50,000 ECGs, you can pick up a lot of patterns, subtle things that humans may not appreciate. It's hidden in plain sight. And so let me tell you how it performed. Um, We measure how good a test is by the area under the curve. A perfect test would be a one. If it says you've got the condition, you have it. If it says you don't, you don't. 
If you flip a coin, it's a 50-50, right? So it's a 0.5. For medical tests, such as a pap smear, it's about a 0.7. A treadmill test is a 0.85. This test, the ability of the AI algorithm reading an ECG to tell you if you have a weak heart pump is a 0.93, a very powerful test. And Incredible. to give you a sense of just how powerful it is, we then said maybe if we tell the computer if the person who's tested is, is a man or a woman, it'll work even better because we know that gender and age affect heart disease. We tried it, it made no difference. And then we said, maybe the computer already knows if you're a man or a woman from the ECG. <laughs> and guess what? It performed phenomenally. Area under the curve for determining gender is 0.97. In other words, a computer <laughs> reading an ECG is better at determining someone's gender than you or I would be just walking down the street looking at somebody, statistically speaking. A Absolutely female fantastic. heart or yeah. a male heart. That's right. Interesting. Poetic, isn't it? Yeah. So, well, but, but hold on. What's the difference? I mean, what's well, the difference between a female heart and a male heart? In a medical sense, philo- uh, as opposed to a philosophical or poetic sense, right. Right. Um, we don't know. And I say we don't know because the tool is a black box. It learns, but what it's looking at is not known. And that's true of all neural networks. So, so huh. everybody who has an EKG now at the Mayo Clinic would, would get this additional uh, artificial intelligence with it and would tell them whether or not their heart is beginning to weaken? So Peter runs our ECG lab. Maybe you want to talk about how we're implementing it. Yeah, we're just now starting to figure out how to apply this to practice. And we are building the infrastructure to allow us to run the algorithm on all the ECGs that we obtain in a given year. We do 250,000 ECGs nearly every year. Now, no cardiologist or doctor or internist has ordered an ECG to look for a low ejection fraction, just like they wouldn't order it to tell if their patient is a man or a woman. So it requires a bit of a change in the way we approach this test, which is not intended as a screen for a low ejection fraction. But we're going to be rolling it out in a randomized trial, essentially, within our primary care practice, starting to give the results to the doctors and see how they make sense of it, whether they order follow-up echoes, what the diagnostic yield is, and hopefully we start to prove that we're able to detect a disease earlier and make a difference for some of our patients. So low ejection fraction means that the heart is not pumping as well as it could. Correct. And it used to be that in order to figure that out, you needed an echocardiogram, which required an hour, fairly expensive. And you can do the same thing now by using artificial intelligence and combining that with an EKG. Right, and of course we'd want a confirmatory test. If we ran this, we took off Dr. Friedman's stethoscope and handed it to you and it was a positive screen, uh, we wouldn't leave it at that. We would want to take a good look at your heart with an echo and figure out exactly what's going on. But as an initial first pass, it's really exciting for us. And And why is it important to know that? Well, the key point is that seven million Americans have a weak heart pump and don't know about it. Meaning, in in the people where it's more overt, where it's already progressed to symptoms, they know. But if you have this condition and don't know about it, you have an increased risk of developing symptoms, an increased risk of dying. And there are more than five um, professional society publications saying, here are medications that we know lower the risk of getting symptoms, strengthen your heart pump, make you live longer. So the goal is to prevent bad things from happening to people by detecting them early. So rather than the old paradigm, I feel sick, I go to the doctor, test her, ordered, we can do a screening test that can be run ultimately when it's done even at home, you know, from a smartphone-based ECG, a watch-based ECG, something else. Now, we haven't extensively tested it that way, but we are in the process of doing that. But the goal is detect disease early, stop it from being bad, and and uh, help people in the process. Who should have this test? Everyone <laughs> or anyone who's just at risk of congestive heart failure? So um, I would say that any our goal is to vet it because um, vet it in an actual practice setting as uh, Peter was mentioning it. And then in that context, we would envision rolling it out so that ultimately anyone getting a medically ordered 12 lead ECG would have the test as a starting point. And in the future, then we'd have to see what groups it may make sense in. It, absolutely fantastic. Wow. I think these guys are pretty smart. I changed my mind. I do want to have, is that stethoscope on me. Right. Be careful what you ask for. I can arrange for it. <laughs> well, a new technique to detect and predict a problem with a heart that is now widely available and inexpensive. Our guests, cardiologist Dr. Paul Friedman and Dr. Peter Noseworthy. It's time for a short break. And when we come back, we'll talk with a woman from Scottsdale, Arizona, who discovered that she had a heart arrhythmia when she tried on her husband's new Apple Watch and ask our experts what wearable technologies can and cannot do.
Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Tracy, when I was in Scottsdale recently, I was talking with a friend, and she is a, a patient at Mayo Clinic Arizona, and she told me that recently her husband got a new Apple Watch. Mm -hmm. And she said, let me try that on. And uh, she did. And as you may know, uh, the newer model has an EKG on it. And she said, well, I'm going to check that out. And she did an EKG on herself, and it said she had atrial fibrillation. Oh so she ended up going to the emergency room, and she's on the phone with us. Mary Schoenbeck, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Shives. Nice to be with you well, thank remotely. You. Yeah, so <laughs> tell us the story. I, I got the first part right, didn't I? You you, you sure did. Yes, you did. I, um, I did wear my husband's Apple Watch. He recently had gotten a Series 4. And the reason was I I was feeling a little off, I guess. Great medical term, I know. But I, I didn't have any pain. I had no shortness of breath, no flu symptoms. But something was telling me something was just a little different with my body. And, and I did have a few heart palpitations. In hindsight, I, I realized I had that. But I attributed that to... I exercise most days, so I thought, well, I'm getting older, and, mm -hmm. and um, it's probably exercising in that. But when I did, um, I, it was just a quick reprogramming of, of my husband's watch for, I believe it's height and weight, so it, it knew my information, and to my surprise, it said AFib. And I'll be honest, I, I really didn't know what AFib was. <laughs> you have much. to Google it. The term, <laughs> but... Um, and then this coincided with um, my annual exam and getting blood work done, and that showed that some of my my numbers were off on my blood work, and that led to a phone call with um, my Mayo uh, PA and nurse. And to my surprise, they did say, "You need to get to the ER." I I, I attribute the Series 4 Apple Watch to bringing to my attention what my body was telling me and and also being able to communicate that. I honestly, with, with Mayo, I honestly don't think I would have mentioned anything about my heart or, you know, feeling off is really not too medical. So um, I, I am very thankful that, and I now have a Series four Apple Watch myself. <laughs> oh, you're gonna get you're gonna get a lot more after this interview airs. <laughs> I I have a feeling, but I have I have told the story just because I I really wasn't educated in this and not feeling sick is was really the key for me. I I didn't think anything was really wrong. Um, other than just minor symptoms. Yeah, if you show up in the emergency room saying, I feel a little off, you're going to sit there a while. <laughs> right. Well, the first thing they did was an EKG. So that that did say, yep, you you are. I had the rapid heart rate. I had all all the signs. So I'm, I'm very thankful um, that it all played out as I did. And obviously, I'm a fan of the Series 4 Apple Watch. Well, they ultimately figured out the cause of your fibrillation, didn't they? They did, and it all is attributed to my thyroid. It Hyper always is. <laughs> hyperthyroidism, which I had no idea I had uh, um, either. And part of that was when the blood, um, when my blood work came back, my lab results, it, it showed that. So Mayo was very quick in saying, okay, the... the the AFib plus my lab work, um, they said, you go, to the A you go to the ER, you may be in thyroid storm, which I didn't realize either. So it, it all played out very well for me, and I'm very thankful. So they got the thyroid problem fixed, and you're now in normal sinus rhythm. Yes. Okay. And I check that once in a while, Dr. Shive. <laughs> <laughs> I might every day. <laughs> as well as well as my, um, I guess, is it BPM, my heart rate? Would, it, it, there's really two features on that Apple Watch that we, ch we check periodically. Yeah, pretty interesting story. So, uh, Dr. Friedman, Dr. Noseworthy, uh, it, I think there are some 6 million people in this country who have atrial fibrillation. Um, why is it a, a, a concern, and is it important that people know whether or not they have it? Yeah, exactly. It's a common uh, condition, and it increases your risk of stroke, which is the major uh, 
issue that we're trying to prevent with atrial fibrillation. So if we can diagnose atrial fibrillation, we can treat it, usually with a blood thinner and anybody who has any other risk factors for stroke. And it's not uncommon that a first presentation of atrial fibrillation is at the time of a stroke, or many times people have a stroke, you have no idea, there's no harbinger whatsoever. So detecting atrial fibrillation early is key. Does everybody who uh, you detect and that has atrial fibrillation that you know about, do you put them on everybody on a blood thinner? Not necessarily everybody, but it's a conversation you should have with your doctor. It ends up being about 85% of people who have atrial fibrillation because atrial fibrillation itself tracks with other risk factors. But there are people who are young and otherwise healthy who may have atrial fibrillation, or like your caller who had it related to her thyroid, she may not require long, long-term long anticoagulation once that you know, has been resolved. Yeah, I, I said um, it always is the thyroid because it always seems like the thyroid is the last thing that people end up checking. But how many people end up with atrial fibrillation because of a thyroid? Is that common? It, it's one of the presenting uh, symptoms of hyperthyroidism. Not a terribly common okay. one, but we always look for it. Okay. If you have atrial fibrillation, your doctor will je- definitely check your thyroid function at least once. But Mary's story, I think, brings out a few points. And Mary, I want to thank you for sharing it with everyone. Because first of all, while heart disease sometimes will knock you off your feet, sometimes it can be subtle. And you said, you know, I don't feel right, and that's not a medical term. But in reality, you know, that that's your body was adjusting well. But picking that up early allows treatment for the underlying disorder if one is present in your case the high thyroid and it looks for screening if there's another potential disorder and it can uh, allow for the use of medication short or long term to prevent stroke so i think it's it's an important point and i think as as we go forward there'll be more and more of these opportunities to because it's far better to detect it take medication than something else the second point mary made which was a little more subtle but worth mentioning is that there's two things that the watch and most sensors are giving her One is the heart rate. The heart rate is measured by using a light on the back. It's called a PPG. And that can sometimes give you warnings, but it can often also give false alarms. And so a lot of people are calling the doctors that said my heart rate was 200, and it may or may not be. But the newer devices that actually record an ECG that we can look at and review, that's powerful because then we can, it can be reviewed by a physician who can look at it and say, oh yes, this actually is atrial fibrillation and needs treatment. Mm -hmm. Oh, what's the future hold? I mean, th- this is pretty an amazing breakthrough to be able to put something on your on your wrist and it can tell you what your heart rate is and, and uh, what and measure your EKG, run an EKG. But but what's next? I mean, this is we're just at the tip of the iceberg, aren't we? We are. There are a, a long list of conditions that I think will be amenable because our bodies are giving off these invisible signals all the time, and the more we can pick them up. I mean, just think about this. Before someone has a heart attack, they've had atherosclerosis or narrowing of the arteries for 10 to 20 years. And so the more we can pick up the body's invisible signals and intervene sooner, the more we can prevent bad things from happening. And and we're just on the beginning cusp of this. I think the science and the technology is going to lurch well ahead of the regulatory issues around these that will be actually require significant addressing because there are no state boundaries when it relates to health, but there are in terms of practice licenses and things like that. Boy, the future is nothing less than exciting, is it? <laughs> For sure. All right, an EKG with artificial intelligence can now detect previously hidden heart disease and holds great promise for saving lives and improving health. And we talked about wearable technology showing real promise and likely one day we'll be able to prevent disease before it strikes. Our thanks to Mary Schoenbeck from Scottsdale, Arizona, and for sharing her story, and to Mayo Clinic heart specialist, Dr. Paul Friedman, Dr. Peter Noseworthy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.